And Warm Trophy Kids presented by Bad News Media. It is week 11 of the college football show. Folks, we are barreling towards the end of the college football season. It's a it's a sad thing. So what we got to do, we got to soak up as much college football as we possibly can in the next couple of weeks. I'm taking advantage of an opportunity to go see Alabama this weekend. I don't know how well that's going to fare for Kentucky, the team that I will be seeing play. Um, I'm based in Cincinnati, for those of you who may not know. And so I'll be making the journey down to the Kentucky Alabama game down in Lexington on this weekend. If you see me out and about, feel free to say hello. Um, love to chat it up, but I'll be taking that in. But that also means that the college recap show and some of the other content that comes out post games uh, will be a bit delayed. I've got my DVR set to record a, a lot of the the heavyweight matches and some of the other smaller games out there that I, that I enjoy watching a lot of Pac-12 stuff. So. The recaps will come out a little bit later than probably expected. Um, we're still going to give out some bets. I'm going to give out some bets on this show. I'm going to give out some bets on our social media pages. So make sure you're following at Trophy Kids Pod on both Instagram and Twitter. Trophy Kids Podcast on TikTok, um, where you can find all of the betting information. But we're going to go ahead and, and attack the board today and talk about some of the big games. And I think it's important to start with the biggest one on the board, arguably. And that is Michigan-Penn State, starting at 12 o'clock, which is an absolute disaster the fact that we can't get this game at night in death valley with a wipeout we gotta we gotta stripe out like what at noon like this is this is the problem i've had with college football scheduling this year you got oklahoma oklahoma state in bedlam for the last time for the foreseeable future and it's a 3 30 kickoff eastern standard time 2 30 their time it's not pitch black that crystal neon black sky that we're used to paddles going absolute chaos at night no 2.30 kickoff. Now we're getting Michigan-Penn State. Huge game with enormous implications to the college football picture. And we're playing it at noon. It's a big noon kickoff. Like, what are what are we doing, folks? Like, how is this not scheduled at night? 8 o'clock, whiteout, Death Valley. Just pure electric football. Like, what are we doing? Um, But the line set at four, over under 45 and a half. And this game is going to be the biggest measuring stick for Michigan. You know, a, a lot's been made out about their toughness of schedule and how they pretty much played nobody. But one of the dominating characteristics that we see of national championship teams or teams that can that have the makeup to compete for a national championship is when they play down, they beat them down. Like, they absolutely go to work on lower-skilled teams. They punch down hard. And then when they have to elevate... They're still punching incredibly hard, but they, they get the win. They they do whatever's necessary to get that win on the field. And th this is going to be the measuring stick. You know, there's a lot of question marks around this Michigan program. I think the side of the ball that I'm going to first start with is Michigan Penn State offense of Michigan defense for Penn State. Good on good. Penn State's best attribute is their defense. We've talked a lot about it. Um, so I, for those loyal listeners, you probably know where I'm going with this. We talked about this in the, the preseason, and it's sort of held true throughout. Penn State and Manny's kind of philosophy is athletes are going to be athletes. We're going to let them man up. We're going to blitz. And we're going to play downhill and fast. And that is what this Penn State team is doing. They've got incredible ed, ru ed rushers and edge players on the defensive line. You know, linebacker plays really good. The, the corner and secondaries are, are, are certainly coming along nicely, I think. The one area of concern I had circled coming into the season was that interior of the defensive line. We sort of saw in the Ohio State game, I think they played really well. Let's see what happens with this Michigan team. Because from a Michigan offensive standpoint, they don't have a guy like Mar Marvin Harrison Jr., they just don't have them on the, the roster. But this is a really well-constructed team. It is a team effort through and through. So while they might not have the absolute man-eater on the outside like Marvin Harrison Jr., Wilson is a very good piece. This is a very complimentary football team. We've seen rushing attacks sort of come down recently, which I, I found interesting. I, it leads me to wonder, you know, two things. And, and we're going to get an answer in this game. Is the Michigan running game down this year? Because they're certainly passing the ball more this year. And I think that is, you know, definitely because JJ can handle it and he has developed really nicely. But even when they do run the ball, it it feels a little less explosive. Like the backs just seem to not have the same pop this year. And that may be by design. You know, they're not getting into rhythm because they're not getting the ball handed off as much. Michigan is sort of saving some things um, from a running game perspective. and. In, in not, you know, 
they know they can beat these teams pretty handily and they've done so and they don't need to to open up the entire playbook. So they keep it relatively sy- simple. Does that change in this game? You know, do they elect to sort of attack that interior of that Penn State defensive line through the A and B gaps and and see if they can they can push them around? Because that's going to be really key for the Ohio State game later down the road, because Ohio State's defensive line is good. That is an elite unit. So this is a real big test point to, to see, you know, what does the battle in the trenches look like? And then I do also wonder, while they don't have a guy like Marvin Harrison Jr. in this passing attack, it's a really good, well-balanced passing attack. And I do wonder, and I think it's it's pretty fair at this point, based on the games we've seen, if they've been holding things back. Because it it would it would seem to me that they are holding things back. And I do wonder what the scheme's going to look like, the creativity from a call standing play standpoint you know how they scheme guys open in this game it's going to be a great test like this is a great um measuring stick to to see how P- michigan's going to handle ohio state and what their ambitions may or may not be big picture you know i have them power rated really really high they're my number two team in the country right now so this is a big matchup i do think they're going to score some points so then the question then becomes what does this penn state offense look like compared to this michigan defense and man oh man i got concerns the offensive line for Penn State is a bit of a sore spot right now for them. It, it's a weak spot. We talked about it um, in the preseason breakdown of this team. Great left tackle. I cannot pronounce his name. I'm not even going to try. Elite left tackle for this Penn State offensive line. Outside of that, though, it's a little rough. The picture's rough. Um, the guard play has underperformed. Uh, the center has developed, I think, a little nicely. I believe he transferred in from like Har- Harvard, maybe, I think. Uh, but he's he's played pretty decently. I I thought he played well in the Ohio State game, but that's a real problem because this Michigan defensive line, I think quietly has not been realized as how good they are. This is a really good defensive line. One of the best defensive lines in the country. Like these, these dudes go to town in the trenches that they're winning the war in the trenches. So if you can't get that push from a Penn State offensive line standpoint, you can't be, you know, effective running the ball, which I, I, I do wonder if either one of these teams is going to be super effective running the ball here. What can you do from a passing attack standpoint? And Drew Aller's definitely developed and he's coming along nicely. I think he just, he isn't there yet. And people are going to point to the Maryland game as like, well, look, this offense can hum. I I looked at that as more as Maryland sort of giving up a little bit on their season, you know, The Ohio State game, I think, is a pretty good script for how this one's going to go, in my opinion. Penn State is lacking the dudes in the wide receiver room this year. The development hasn't come just yet there. And we sort of implied that might be an issue heading into the Ohio State game because they really, to that point, hadn't tried to develop a deep threat passing game. They I would have liked to see them in some of their weaker competition games really try to push the ball down the field and, and try to develop and get some good practice in the, the deep passing game because ultimately that's how you're going to have to beat Michigan. This is not a team that really lets you drive the length of the field. This isn't a team that you can be methodical against. They are could be susceptible to some explosive plays, but if you can't present those explosive plays, this defense only gets better the closer you get to the red zone. They really button it up. The window is becoming incredibly small. They are physical on the outside. The defensive line is world eaters. Like it, it's it's a physical unit. They get some hands on you. This is a really well rounded defense. And so if you can't find success through the ground. I don't think Penn State has the pieces offensively to have success. I think this is going to be a, a relatively low-scoring affair. I think these two defenses, it's a heavyweight fight with these two defenses. But Michigan offers more on the offensive side of the ball Um, to, I think, with this game. And I, I, I do like them to cover in this spot. I, I think there's a real good opportunity here um, for them to cover. And... We can always sort of count on James Franklin to do something weird in the, in a big time game that that usually doesn't lead to success. So I think we're going to count on that a little bit here. We're going to count on the fact that JJ's developed nicely. This is such an important game, though. I'm going to rewatch this thing like two or three times to really figure out what this Michigan team is going to have against a, a Ohio State game. It's a great measuring stick game. Alabama, Kentucky, the game I am going to. Let's talk Jalen Milrow. Like, let's talk about him because we... On, I, on this podcast, have been high on, on Jalen Milrow. I thought that while he wasn't like an elite-level quarterback, 
he offered enough in the run game and the deep ball ability to really help elevate this Alabama team and keep them in the national championship playoff championship, SEC championship conversation. And it, we just had to see how he was going to develop over the season. And he's developed really well. That LSU game was great. I think the one point of pushback we I would have a little bit on the narrative is that, and we talked about this in breaking down that game last week. It's what led me to bet pe- Alabama and think they were going to win that game is LSU was down Wingo, their best defender when it came to, to defending the run. And they were down all four transfers that they had brought into the secondary in the offseason. They identified that their secondary was a real problem. Uh, it was a down spot for them, a, a weak point. And they went out in the portal and they tried to get some pieces. And all four of those guys were out for the Alabama game. So LSU elected to say, hey, we're not going to let you beat us with the big explosive plays down the field like you want to. And, and, and we talked about just the insane statistics that Milrow and this offense puts up when they push the ball 15 or 20 yards more down the field. You're going to have to be a little bit more methodical. You're going to have to go through your reads against us. And Milrow did that. Now, it's a, it's a banged up defensive unit, but he answered the call. He was efficient in the passing game. I thought he was really good in going through progressions and, and showing improvement in the short to intermediary game. And if he can continue to build on that, oof, this Alabama team becomes Georgia's nightmare fuel because we've seen Georgia's maybe Achilles heel defensively is a mobile quarterback. So big effort. Now you get a, a Kentucky team that <laughs> defensively struggles to defend against the pass. and is going to be really susceptible on the back end. But the Kentucky offense has come along pretty nicely. You know, we talked about in the bye week how they really tried to hone in the passing game and, and spent a lot of time trying to get that that going. And it has showed recently. Leary has started to look more and more like the quarterback I thought he was going to be heading into Kentucky. Um, I think the peck injury, I underestimated a little bit the peck in, injury and, and how much of an effect that would have on his game. But he's starting to hum a little bit. I don't have great anticipation that Kentucky's going to really hang in this game late. Um, I think they're going to get worn down here. I don't necessarily have a pick just yet on the number. I'm kind of waiting to see if it maybe pops down to a 10 to, to really maybe pull the trigger here. So I don't have a betting line here. It's just I wanted to take a time to to really talk about Jalen Milrow and, and how this team has been progressing and why Nick Saban is the GOAT when it comes to college football. Like his teams just get better and better. He is a legit coach. In today's day and age, there are so many guys that are system guys that no matter what the team presents, they're just going to run their system. And Nick Saban has shown over the years that not only is he willing to adapt to the current situation in college football, to the strategies that are being implemented, to the recruiting, to, to everything. He just adapts. But he also has shown throughout the years that what the Alabama team starts as is not what they're going to finish as that he is going to really help mold this team and mold the philosophies and willing to change mid season, what they do to fit his team the best. And it's why he is the absolute best head coach in college football um, and a real coach. And when it comes to developing guys and just being a coach, really earning that title of coach. Um, so I, I really like what they've done here. I just wanted to take the time to kind of commend them on that. Um, all right, kind of moving down the board, uh, still here, you know, we've got some interesting games as a whole, um, to say the least, uh, I don't have a take on the UConn James Madison game, but I do have a take on this whole situation in that once again, the NCAA is the dumbest organization in the world. The fact that you're not letting JMU compete in bowls and compete in their conference championship because they're new. To, to this level of division one football is ridiculously stupid. Um, this team has far exceeded any expectations. And I guess like, I don't know, probably 60 years ago, they implemented these rules to try to um, discourage teams from making the jump and to try to prepare them for that jump. Jamie, you seems plenty capable of handling the jump. This is a ranked football team back-to-back -back years of just being a wagon in their conference. Um, this athletic department has done a really good job. The football staff has done a really good job. And to punish the kids for not only beating expectations, but by beating them a mile. They can't play in a bowl. They can't play in their conference championship. It's archaic and stupid. And once again, the NCAA is so far behind in the worst institution right now. They don't care about the kids. 
All right. And we've known that everybody knows that that has two brain cells. This organization is not about the betterment of student athletes or the kids. It's about the betterment of the wallet of the NCAA. And this is just a stupid rule. Luckily, the new head of the NCAA does seem to be more willing to be adaptive um, and to change things. And I really, really hope that these kids get rewarded for their hard work and success and get to play in a bowl game and get to play in their conference championship game and, and get to, to see this season through like they should. Um, all right, let's talk about some betting lines though. Some more Utah, Washington, three thirty. line is at eight over under 49 and a half. Washington's a little bit in danger. Um, Utah, this is a very interesting game. If this was being played at Utah, you already know where I'd be going with this bet. One of the best home field advantages in college football, Kyle Winningham and what he has done at that program has been nothing short but miraculous and incredible. And he is one of the best football coaches in college football. Um, but it's not being played in Utah. It's being played in Washington. And there might be a little inclement weather, so it's something to watch and monitor as we get closer to kickoff here because what Washington wants to do offensively is, is pass the ball. And we talked about how they needed to probably get more back to a, a well-balanced rushing attack. We saw that in the USC game, them getting back to that, those ways, um, which is really important because we talked about how, you know, this rushing attack had been really down um, in the three weeks leading up to that USC game, averaging 67 yards a game, 13 against Arizona State. And it, it was really just about not giving the carries and not being well balanced and, and having Penix rip it. And I did wonder heading into that USC game, had he been playing a little bit hurt because he just he looked uncomfortable and a little bit off and he has a track record of being injury. So nothing crazy, but just being a little banged up um, and the team as general being a little banged up. You know, this is, this is the problem with teams like Washington that unfortunately, you know, the frontline talent is really good in these, these types of years. It's the back end that, that struggles and you need to have depth. This is a sport of attrition. You got to, you know, you're going to play through some banged up injuries, but you got to be able to rotate some fresh bodies in. And there were concerns about whether or not they were going to be doing that. I think USC went a long way and that's a bad defense. And we'll talk about them later here. And we've talked about them a lot, but that went a long way to show that, all right, this team seems to be getting kind of a second breath. You know, they're starting to starting to get back to their ways. They're being a little bit more balanced in, in rushing and passing. Um, and they're going to need to be in this spot because Utah presents a lot of really big challenges defensively. This is a really physical football team. Um, they've always have been much more physical than the rest of the teams in the Pac-12. That is Kyle Winningham's style. Um, it, it's a really good defense. Offensively, though, it's struggling, and that's what happens when Cam Rising can't play this season, and Kufi was was out for some considerable time, and you're now on your third string quarterback, and you found some stability, but it's a little bit of a, a rocky start here. And I, I just, while the Washington defense is not the best, it's good enough, and I do wonder about the path to success for Utah offensively defensively they're there it's this is going to be a really tough game for washington I, I like this in maybe a teaser bet you know betting it down to the two number for washington or hell even betting it up for utah um I, i'd probably go down the washington way but i i don't hate either one of these in a teaser bet um i, I think this is going to be probably a, a close game it's the later part of the game you know what team is worn down more where this thing might open itself up but I do think uh, I think it's worth a, a look and maybe a, a teaser bet if if you're crafting one of those this this week. Um, Tennessee, Missouri line is at minus three. Tennessee is the favorite over under fifty nine and a half. Timing is everything in life, folks, and timing is everything in this game. Missouri coming after off a absolute slugfest with Georgia. I mean, giving everything you had in the tank to it. Where Tennessee just played UConn and. They just strolled in. <laughs> they the starters didn't play very long. They had very early success. They got rested. And that is that's an important part for this game. That's important dynamic to this game. You know, I, I think the Tennessee defense line is is really good and improved and can get after it here. Um, the same concerns I had in the Georgia game are the same concerns I have in this game for Missouri. Cooks is good. I think he's a slightly above average 
kind of college dude, like your average college dude, a Jag. I think he's better than that, but not exponentially better. And I do wonder here, you know, they're going to scheme it up, right? They're going to scheme it up to get some points. They're going to scheme it up to get some guys open. I said they were going to do that in the Georgia game. That's exactly what they did, but they just don't have it to close it out. I kind of feel maybe this might be the same spot here. You know, Tennessee is rested. They're more rested. Really tough defensive line. An offense that, while yes, is is down compared to last year, hard not to be with the guys that left, but is still humming. Heupel's really good at scheming things up. The Missouri defense is good. Uh, I just, I wouldn't be shocked if Missouri pulled this off, but it's re- it's an uphill battle. It's a really big uphill battle. And I, I think that just that simple rest factor is the difference maker here. And maybe not, you know, if this game was being played earlier in the season, I, I wouldn't necessarily have the take, but to the similar point that I brought up against Washington with these programs that are not the cream of the crop, the Georgias, the Ohio States, the Michigans, you know, the even Oregon's, um, the Florida States, we've seen it on their defense and being able to rotate fresh bodies in these really deep rosters. When you, when you get these schools like the Missouri's who, yeah, Everything has gone right on the front end talent, the development, the play calling, all of it's there to be a really good football team, to hang in games. The depth just isn't. And that depth becomes an issue as we go further and further into the season because guys are getting tired. Legs are starting to to fall off a little bit here, you know, and and you just had a slugfest against Georgia. I do wonder if they have enough gas in the car to get it across the finish line in this game. Um, so yeah, that, that that's where that one lines up. Um, <clears throat> uh, this this game has got some differing opinions on it, and that is Old Miss Georgia. Line is at ten, over under fifty eight and a half. I think the part we the the differing opinions come from is what this Old Miss defense is. It's improved when we look at it from last year's perspective. It's an improved defense. Pete Golden is an awesome defensive coordinator, really good. And we have seen that change already happen this season. Guys are playing a little bit more loose. They're playing downhill. They seem to understand things a little bit better. So that allows them to play faster defensively, but it's a unit that is still not there yet. And I don't think the expectation should be that it's going to be there yet. You know, we've seen this across the country, whether it's, you know, Dion at Colorado or, uh, you know, Dan Landing last year at Oregon or other coaches in their first year getting a hold of their teams. It's really hard to improve in just one year. It's getting easier with the portal, but it's still incredibly hard to upgrade what you want that talent to look like and what you want that defense to look like and to be able to 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 play the way you want to play. And I think that's the problem here for Ole Miss. I think that it is improved when you consider last year's team to this year's unit, but it's not where it needs to be for a game like this. And I do think Beck's going to have some success here. I think that they're going to be able to attack this defense and, 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 and find some success. So the question then becomes, can old Miss's offense find success against a Georgia defense that compared to last year and the year before that is down and regressed. But of course it has. When you send that much talent to the NFL, it, it's really hard to reload. It's still a very good defense when you look at defenses this year and where the defenses across the nation are. Really good defense. Definitely missing Jalen Carter on the defensive line. But a really good defense nonetheless. A physical defense. Corners are not afraid to get hands on you. Um, type of deal. Lane Kiffin plays to win the game. And you can't say that about every coach. A lot of coaches play to not get embarrassed. They play scared. They play chicken shit football. You hear me say that a lot on the live kind of videos and things like that. When a coach is playing chicken shit football and not playing to win, but playing to not get embarrassed, you know, kicking field goals when you probably should be going Greg shot a great example last week in uh, Ohio state Rutgers kicking that field goal in the red zone, virtually on, on the goal line. Lane Kivitz going for that because he's playing to win the game. Um, And that's a very different mindset, but that makes it, a very there's a dual sword to that can certainly keep you in games like this and give you a shot to win if it's working if it's not it's a blowout because you're turning the ball over on your side of the field you're giving georgia's offense really good field position you know those type that's the danger in betting this game and so for me 
I haven't wagered this yet. I'm considering putting it in a teaser leg. But that's the part that scares me off Old Miss. If I'm going to bet this game, which I haven't bet it yet, I love, I, I think I want the more balanced approach, the proven entity, the team that roster wise is really good compared to the guy that's going to risk it. If I'm not wagering this game and I'm watching it for fun, I'm rooting for Lane Kiffin. It's awesome football. I want that football to be rewarded. I want guys to be more risk takers. I want more coaches to play to win the game. Um, and I think Dart has gotten better this season. He's really good. Dart's throwing darts. Um, and this offense is humming better. Lane Kiffin's a great schemer up. You know, I, He's found his home at Old Miss. He is going to be a coach that, unless Alabama reaches out for him to be Nick Saban's replacement down the line, which I don't think is out of the realm of possibility, if you know anything about that relationship, he's staying at Ole Miss. He's going to become Ole Miss. Ole Miss is going to become Lane Kiffin. And so that's where I'm at with this. But I haven't wagered it yet. It, it may find its way onto the card. We'll we'll kind of see. Um, another game worth talking about, I think, is obviously USC-Oregon. Line is at 16, over under 76. And folks, if you go, wow, USC 16? Don't blame yourself. You don't see this happen very often. USC, even in through like the Clay Helton era and, and sort of the last decade or so, them being a, over a double touchdown favorite, rare. It's a rare thing in this sport. But they are a 16-point underdog. I said favorite there, men underdog. Um, going up to Eugene, Oregon. The Grinch who stole defense is gone. Taylor Mays, an analyst, if you remember from his days at USC, could lay the wood, is stepping into a more responsible role. You're elevating two defensive coaches to kind of split the D.C. Uh, coordinator position. There's been a lot of talk about simplifying things this week, sort of the men mentality of you got to see the ball go through the hoop a little bit here, keeping it simple. I think that will allow USC's defense to be better. You know, Alex Grinch found a lot of success. You got to think about his coaching journey. Started at Washington when Leach was there and the mentality that was developed there compared to those expectations he met. And it was a mentality of, Hey, we got an awesome offense. They're going to score points. We as a defense can play a little bit riskier because they're going to score points. So we can, instead of going for the sure tackle, go for the strip instead of, you know, wrapping out the wide receiver, we can try to pick off the route. That type of mentality, more turnover based, softer coverages, not playing as downhill, making the sure tackle physical football. And that was wildly successful at Washington. Goes to OSU, less successful, moves to Oregon, though, or, or Oklahoma. And that's where things started to fall off a little bit. You look at the statistics, they got better year in and year out, but we're never meeting the expectation that I think many would have of an Oklahoma-style program and what that defense should look like based on the talent. Goes to USC, Similar issues. I had high hopes for him this year. I thought with the talent on that roster, it's not the most talented, but they were going to be better than they are. They were not. He gets fired. They're going to simplify things. I think they're going to get a boost from that early. The question, though, then becomes, this isn't a game of adjustments. Oregon has shown the ability to adjust as the game moves on. How do you counter that? Because it can't be we're going to run the exact same thing for the full 60 minutes. You might have early success, you're going to get shredded at some point by this team. This is an insanely good team. They know who they are defensively and offensively. They make good adjustments. They are the right level of cocky because they're going to, they're out there to beat your ass. And they go about it that way. They walk the walk. They talk the talk. They walk the walk. This is a damn good football team, folks. Make no bones about it. USC has a shot to cover this number. The problem becomes if things don't go right early, how much does this team fight late? Because the season is, is essentially lost unless you win this game, which then season's lost from a playoff run, but a PAC 12 championship run, not completely off the table yet, folks. So, but if things go bad early, how much fight is in this team? How much of it, how much of that raw, raw mentality is in this team? How much of I'm not going to get embarrassed. I'm going to fight until the final whistle is in this team. 
We're going to we're going to get a lot of lot of answers in this game. Another game worth maybe teasing here at the spot it's at. Um those are the big games. Texas TCU, I like TCU might put up some points, but Texas should roll that. Malik Murphy is good enough to steer the ship and not fully crash it, but the sides are going to get banged up a little bit here. You know, this is a guy that has talent. He's a freshman. He started in two high pressure, really tough games. Turnovers followed later in those games. They turned a little bit into a pumpkin offensively, but defense picks up the offense. Offense picks up the defense sometimes in this sport. Defense picked up the offense. Malik Murphy's just got to limit the turnovers a little bit. Steer the ship until Ewers comes back, which I think he can. Texas is still rolling. They're good to go. Um, That's it for the big game breakdowns as of right now. Um, I think that, you know, I'm pretty good with the Michigan bet. I've I've laid that as a wager. Um, I'm going to stick with that one on today for today's podcast. Um, Talked about some teasers opportunities in there. Uh, This is going to be a really great game to see how the end of the season is going to wrap up. Oh, let's talk quickly about Arizona, Colorado. We've talked a lot about Deion Sanders and Colorado. I really want to talk about this Arizona team. I I briefly mentioned them a couple podcasts ago about a team that is quietly just getting better and better and better. If Oklahoma State didn't exist, this is the best turnaround in college football this year, I think, in the season. This is a really good football team, folks. It's a really well-coached team. It's a team that is firing on all cylinders. I mean, they make no doubt about it. This is a really good football team. Um, the defense is solid. You've had um, an awesome, awesome story in Fita. Fita? I think I said this. I'm terrible with names. But starting quarterback. They made a change to him. He's been phenomenal. That's going to be a really fun game to watch. What level of fight does this Colorado team still have versus how good is this Arizona team? Shadur Sanders, give this man all the credit in the world. He is tough as nails. This man keeps peeling his body off the mat because he is getting absolutely destroyed back there this season. And I've talked a lot about offensive philosophies, especially on TikTok and social media, and I'm not really going into that right now. Give credit to this man. This man is leaving it all out there. I do start to wonder, though, depending on how this game goes, if you just don't pull him and try to save him physically a little bit here because he is beat up and it's tough to watch late in games as he's he's really just having to peel himself off the mat. And it, it, it's not funny, but it's give this man credit, like really give him, this is a tough, tough kid. Um and I think what he's done is commendable this season. And we'll talk more about the mixed bag that was Colorado season, you know, when we get to the end of the season here. But you got to give Shador Sanders credit. The dude is tough as nails. Um, so that's what I see as of right now. We'll give out some additional bets uh, and what I'm betting on Trophy Kids Pod. Make sure to subscribe on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. Cards come out sat- Saturday morning, full cards. You got some bets on this game. Hopefully you got some information to help you think about some things here. Um, and make sure to like, subscribe. NFL podcast is out. That's a great one going over every game. We've got more bets given out on that podcast this week. Um, and as always, peace. Thank you.